Well, um, thanks for having us. Uh, you know, normally it's just me, but I brought along uh, Lawson Than and Plan, who uh, works with me. Um, he is uh, uh, one of our key lawyers on our real estate team. So if you're ever dealing with our firm, you're probably going to deal with me and Lawson at some point. Um, Lawson's currently in the office. I'm currently working from home. Uh, it's been a it's been a weird couple months. And um, on that note, we're sort of going over the usual topics. But I was going to speak to each of these topics in the light of COVID nineteen and sort of how that has. Uh, um, and we'll try to answer everyone's questions. So if anyone has questions, please direct them to Jane and. And uh, but just tell, uh, talking louder because you can hear me. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just going to mute everybody. Sorry, David. I think a few people had their mics on. So, okay, that's been fixed. <laughs> yeah, so, my, my take I mean, the market has definitely changed, and, and some of the things we're concerned about has, has changed in, in different ways over the course of the last six months, um, in different ways. Um, and right now, we're at this point where there's a lot of uncertainty when people are, are signing contracts to buy properties and, and dealing with you guys and looking at properties, there's a lot of uncertainty. Some people think uh, things are going to get worse before they get better. Um, actually, it's interesting because I think most people think that I don't really run into many people who, who thinks we're out of the weeds yet. Um, and the way that sort of relates to real estate contracts is um, you might be in situations if you're acting for a seller, there's a risk that if closing is happening in two months, there may be a vastly different situation and buyers will want to get out of these contracts. So if you're representing a seller, you want to make the contract as firm as possible and make it more difficult for buyers to walk away. So that includes asking for higher deposits, putting in clauses regarding uh, how closing will work if people can't meet in person, uh, things like that. If you're representing buyers, um, you want to make sure it, it seems in some markets, it is very much a seller's market uh, as it has been for the last couple of years. So it's difficult to do a lot of the due diligence you should be doing, but you know, make sure buyers really inspect the properties. Uh, make sure they're sure they want to buy it. Make sure you've uncovered all problems with the properties, home inspections, conditions on financing, things like that. Um, and maybe uh, you want to think of some some clauses to, to loosen up the commitment a bit if, if a seller is willing to agree to that. I mean, there one thing we had at the beginning of COVID was I noticed a lot of buyers were worried about losing their jobs. So when they were signing contracts to buy a house, they were worried that they had a job now, but they may lose their jobs in a month and then they wouldn't qualify for a mortgage anymore and not be able to fulfill the deal. So I, I had a lot of buyers who were trying to move the closing date up as quickly as possible so they could get, get through the deal. I mean, obviously it raises the question is how are you going to pay for a mortgage if you don't have any income, but people didn't seem to be worried about that at the time. Um, yeah, that's right. And we did see a lot of, um, you know, people who were pre pre-approved um, suddenly not have that pre-approval in place because they had lost their job or they were temporarily laid off. So, um, yeah, that was something that, uh, you know, we were putting an offer still conditional on financing and finding that out in the process. So at least it wasn't a firm offer in those cases, at least in um, my experience. Now we're seeing a lot of firm offers. I know you always recommend against that. <laughs> well, if I'm acting for a seller, definitely a firm offer is, is a great thing to have. But if you're ask, acting for a buyer, uh, do make sure you've covered all your bases before going firm, because as we've discussed in previous sessions, these contracts are very difficult to get out of once you go firm. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Let me just share the next screen here because I know that people will have questions. So um, again, I, I still have people joining us right now. So please do comment right now. Uh, let me know if you do have any questions. And uh, if you have questions that you think of later, this is how you can reach David at Coach House Law. Um, I don't think I have your direct email address, info at coachhouselaw.com. I'm sure we'll get to you as well. Or to Lawson. Yeah, we, maybe we can circulate it afterwards. So it's just our email address. It's just david at coachhouselaw.com. And for Lawson, it's just lawson at coachhouselaw.com. For sure. So yeah, so I'm going to share this uh, contact information with you guys again, but just know that's uh, how you can reach out. So yeah, let's, uh, let's jump in and talk about um, some different situations that can come up and how to deal with them. I know we get a lot of questions about this. 
Um, specifically, we have a workplace group where people comment with different situations. One of the recent ones that I saw come up was about selling a property with um, tenants in place. Left as a gunman. Oh. Fuck. You know. <laughs> Sorry, David, you're muted here. Let me just unmute you. I think I can, okay, I should be unmuted now. Awesome, okay, thanks for that, sorry. That question was around uh, rental properties. I'm sorry. Yeah. I that. And selling tenanted properties and uh, what sort of notice you have to give them. Um, I know there's been situations obviously where uh, the tenant is still in their one year lease term. You know, are, what are the situations there? Uh, yeah, what are the this, this is challenging and extra challenging in the present time. I mean, in the last six months, uh, it, was, it was especially challenging because the landlord tenant board had closed down and um, uh, people, it was, you know, it was really hard to have a, a tenant leave a property. Um, from from one one side of things, tenants have rights. I mean, when you rent a property to a tenant, uh, you know, it's only fair that they should feel secure in their home and not feel threatened that they have to move out on a whim. So it's really nice that we have these those rules. But uh, as agents, when we're trying to buy and sell properties, and sometimes you want to shift people around, it 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 makes it a little inconvenient for your getting your deal done. Um, and during COVID, it was next to impossible. If somebody refused to uh, leave and the landlord was completely in the right, it was going to be, you know, a, a really a impossible uphill quest to try and remove them. Um, I would recommend as a starting point, the uh, landlord tenant uh, tribunal website. Uh, it has a whole section for landlords and a whole section for tenants and uh, amazing sections on Q and uh, sort of FAQs on what can I do in this situation? What can I do in this situation? The important thing to remember is that every situation have, has a different set of rules. So if you're um, asking a tenant to leave because you uh, want to sell the property and the buyer wants to move into the property, uh, that's permitted if the term of the lease has expired. Uh, if they're still in their one year term, then you have to ride out the term. Um, and then you have to give them the normal notice provisions, which uh, are typically 60 days, uh, and you'll have to pay them uh, at least one month rent. Um, what, what happens in other situations, but if you're doing that, you actually have to, pr the, the buyer has to move in, um, and, you, and you have to prove it if, if the tenant takes you to the landlord tenant board. So you'll need an affidavit from the buyer saying, I, I plan to move in and stay there for at least one year. Uh, otherwise they can be subject to fines. Um, so that's probably the most common situation w realtors are involved in where you're, you're acting for someone selling or buying and the person buying wants to move into the property. What can't happen is you can't sell to another buyer, have the tenant removed, and then the new buyer rents it to someone new. That, that's, you know, that's strictly not permitted. Um, and there are hefty penalties associated with things like that. And it would be the new buyer who would suffer those penalties. Is that correct? If they were to try to do that? That's right. Yeah. I mean, if it depends on the situation. If the new buyer says they plan to occupy it for their personal use and then they don't, then they would be in trouble. Um, if the seller tells a buyer, tells the tenant that, and that doesn't actually happen, then the seller could also be responsible um, if it wasn't true. So, um, I think the penalty is $25,000. Um, and, and the landlord tenant board is generally very pro tenant. I mean, everyone says that. Uh, so I don't know if that's a, a accurate um, explanation, but it does seem like they are there to protect tenants. And, and generally, if you are a landlord and you are in the right, you really have to cross all your T's and dot all your I's and do everything absolutely perfect um, for, for you to get anything to happen at landlord tenant board. Um, okay. yeah. Awesome. So again, for those of you guys who are uh, listening in, if you have any questions about rental properties, maybe you have a listing coming up, questions around that, um, ask away. Um, I come across a situation where um, it's about rental increases. So if a property is 
uh, neighbor property, I understand that it's not subject to um, those, the, the cap, I guess, the whatever percent it is. Is that correct? Is that, um, so somebody who owns a newer building can sort of increase um, rent arbitrarily? The rules were changed a couple times recently. So it used to be that there, so there's, the, there's government statutory annual rent increases that you have to follow. Um, and uh, I have to confirm about that with new buildings. Uh, so I'll, I'll send an email around to everybody with exactly how that works. But generally um, what happened is the government uh, removed the cap and then added it back on and there's different rules for different ages of buildings. But I think generally now with new buildings, uh, you can increase rent. Um, but I think, I think there's still sort of a maximum uh, guideline. So let me get back to you on that one. Okay, awesome. Yeah, because I came across that one and I was, um, yeah, I was surprised by that. So um, we do have a question coming in. What other common mistakes do salespeople make regarding contracts? Ooh, that's a good one. Salespeople, uh, when you're acting for a buyer or a seller? Um, let's talk about representing buyers because I think that's what, um, you know, we do most commonly. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think, um, the, the standard OREA uh, form of contracts that uh, you all use are, in some ways, they, they cover a lot of ground. They're pretty, um, uh, they're pretty all encompassing, but at the same time, I think a lot of people use those and don't really understand what all the clauses mean and, and how they, they work specifically. And there's a lot of things you can add in to sort of strengthen some of those clauses and make them more pro buyer. Um, some things that uh, I find buyer agents perhaps do is um, that, that maybe they should think a bit more about is, um, is things, with, it, things with conditions. So I, I know that most of this is market driven, but if you can, if you can insert, the, the more conditional you can make an offer for a buyer and give them enough time to review and do due diligence, that's, that's the best I think you can do for your buyer within, within the scope of still getting the deal done. So as long as you can use your negotiating skills to convince a seller to allow your buyer more time to investigate a property, uh, solidify financing, uh, have a home inspection, uh, look at a status certificate on a condo, all of these types of things, you're, you're really doing your job for your buyer. Um, I see in this market, what happens a lot is people uh, sign firm contracts right away. Um, and sometimes there's multiple offers and sometimes sellers insist on that, but it's very dangerous to buy something without really knowing what you're buying. Um, so, so that's sort of high level what I, I think uh, we need to be cognizant of with, with these contracts. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's, you know, does anyone have any situations of, of, you know, questions about specific clauses they should include in contracts or anything like that. Um, I know that, uh, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes buyers uh, sort of don't really think about timelines. Um, you know, you're, 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 you're really keen to get the deal done and you sort of flip to a calendar and think, when do you want to close? This isn't really an error, but it's just sort of, I find good housekeeping. A lot of people are always closing deals on, uh, on the first of the month or the last day of the month. And for that reason, uh, everybody in the industry, mortgage lenders, mortgage brokers, realtors, lawyers, uh, everybody is so busy on the first and the, and the 30th of the month. And it just kind of makes no sense to do it. Uh, yeah, like you can close any day of the week. So I always recommend, you know, set a closing date for midweek. So if it doesn't close on a Wednesday, at least you can get the deal done the next day on a Thursday, uh, rather than a Friday where you might have to wait until Monday or if it's a long weekend, wait until Tuesday um, and not do it on sort of the first or 30th of the month because it, it is, it, these things aren't automatic and, and mortgage lenders are very manually driven. So every deal, there's somebody like reviewing everything and funding the deal. So on really busy, busy days, like, you know, July 1st or, uh, or June 30th, you have 
you know, mortgage lenders aren't fi funding deals until two, three, four in the afternoon and everybody's all worked up and waiting for their keys and things like that. So that's just a, that's just a little thing you can do to, you know, maybe make, make things less stressful for everyone at the end of the day. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I did. Uh, I was recently working with renters who, um, you know, obviously they wanted to give their notice and they would be wanting to take possession on the first, but actually what they did, it was their uh, request to move in um, a few days before the end of the month. So they had their rental until the end of the month, but they had 10 days to kind of slowly start moving in because it closed, you know, before the end of the month. So there was a bit of an overlap there. So that makes sense for everybody. Um, all right, so what is the best way to put a firm offer and still save the client if mortgage is not approved? I know it's tricky. That's why a lawyer's answer is needed. <laughs> Thanks, Kashif. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's a really important question because how are you gonna buy a property if you, if you can't get a mortgage? Um, my answer to that is don't go firm unless you're sure you can have the financing uh, because uh, not having financing at the end of the day is not going to allow your client to walk away from a, from a contract. So they could get into a lot of hot water. Um, I know that's not answering a question and I, I don't think there is a really good way. I think the solution is um, don't go firm until you're sure you're going to be able to close the deal. Uh, you could put in uh, some condition, you know, yeah, you, you have to have a condition essentially. Um, and, and one thing that, I, I think people don't think about is just because you have a pre-approval from a bank, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to, your mortgage is going to fund. It's really just um, reducing the risk that you're not going to be able to get funding on the day of closing. Even if you have the most, you know, solid commitment from a major bank saying we will fund this mortgage on uh, October 31st, if the economy take goes south and the bank's are reevaluating all their risk profiles, they may actually back out of things last minute. So that's, that's really, there's a really low risk that that happens, but um, you never know a mortgage is actually funded until it's funded. Uh, so I don't know, that's just something uh, philosophical to think about that, you know, having, even having like a commitment from a bank doesn't mean the mortgage is going to go through. Our underwriters can always call it last minute, but the more as a buyer, you can reduce the risk that you're not going to be able to get financing, you're in a better position. So getting that commitment letter from the bank, getting a, a, that pre-approval. There's a difference between a pre-approval and a commitment. Pre-approval is sort of a blanket uh, where a bank's going to say, yeah, I think we'll fund something for you in this price range. Whereas a commitment is for a specific property, a specific date, a specific terms of a loan. So that's more solid than uh, just a general pre-approval. So... Right. And you know, just uh, also further to that question, so if there is a firm offer and then the client can't get their mortgage approved, what happens to their deposit? And should we be getting, if we're representing the seller, should we be getting signed signs mutual release? I know that was in another discussion that was kind of circulating. So what happens to the deposit? The deposit. Oh, that's, good. that's a good question. Good question. The deposit uh, sits in trust typically with the listing brokerage. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that anybody gets that deposit. The deposit doesn't automatically go to a, a seller if the buyer doesn't follow through on a deal. It, it's essentially a sign of good faith, and it's showing that you're serious about the contract. It's putting money in trust, so you know there's money there. There's risk if you walk away. If a deal doesn't happen or there's problems with a deal, the buyer and seller will need to sign a mutual release to release that deposit back to whoever, you know, usually it'd be for a buyer, it'd be great to get the full deposit back. Usually that's not the case. Usually there's some sort of negotiation and they agree on a price to release each other from a deal, or maybe they just can't agree on anything and it goes, uh, goes on uh, to court. Um, and the deposit is not also the only damage that a buyer can be liable for. I think this is a bit of a misconception. Some people think, oh, I, I've put down a $25,000 deposit so worst, case, worst thing that's going to happen is I lose that. Um, no, things could be a lot worse. If you um, breach a contract and don't follow through on a transaction, the seller could then sell you for all, all of their damages. Uh, if they have to relist the, the property and they get less money for it, they can sue you for the difference. Uh, if they were trying to buy a new property and they can't move in and they can't complete their transaction because you walked away from the first transaction, they can sue you for all the damages associated with that. 
uh, and it could be quite large and, and quite painful. So uh, one thing to be aware of is uh, putting down the deposit isn't kind of your minimum damage if, if things go wrong. It, it could be a lot worse. Uh, so something to think about. Other thing about deposits too is I remember back in 2017, the market in Toronto took kind of a really big upswing. Um, so a lot of people were buying uh, properties at really high values. Um, and what happened from February 2017 to sort of May, June, is a lot of those properties, the values kind of went down or weren't getting as much money. So a lot of these buyers who signed these really big contracts had a bit of buyer's remorse and they wanted to get out of these contracts. And I remember being in a, a number of situations where there were buyers who had no ties to Canada, foreign buyers, and they had put down really small deposits and some of them just walked away. And what's really difficult is to pursue somebody uh, from a, a litigation standpoint in another country uh, that doesn't, you know, doesn't recognize Canadian law or Canadian okay. jurisdiction. So you're, you're kind of, you know, if you're a seller and you've sold a property for a really high price, but you have a tiny deposit and the buyer has no ties to Canada, no assets, no, you know, not concerned about getting sued in Canada, you, you might be stuck with only trying to fight for that deposit. There may be nothing else you can, you can go after. Um, so that's a, that's another consideration, especially with COVID and uncertainty. If, uh, if the market were to, you know, go in the wrong direction and people wanted to get out of deals, uh, having a deposit is security, but it's not, you know, you're going to go for damages that are much higher if, if there are the, such damages. Okay, that's perfect. That actually addresses a question that came in about um, cash buyers, specifically from China. It sounds like um, someone was interested. I'm not sure what the question is specifically here about whether or not to work with those cash buyers and maybe what to be aware of. Uh, it's a really good question. Um, so from, from the legal standpoint, obviously we're, we're concerned about on my end. You know, when we're at the point of buying property, it may not, uh, it may not be the, the lawyer's issue to deal with. What If you're a foreign buyer from China, you're going to have problems trying to bring in money easily without paying tax, uh, things like that. But from a, the, uh, the side of purchasing real estate, I mean, sellers are happy to just, you know, if the cash is coming from a buyer, or from a, a lender to the buyer, to the seller, uh, at the end of the day, the seller's still getting paid for their property. So generally with buying, cash is, is great. Uh, so, uh, but on the other end of that is how, how is that buyer getting cash into Canada? Are, then there's all the questions around, are they foreign buyers? If they're foreign buyers, there's uh, this new foreign buyers tax in, in the, the greater Golden Horseshoe area. Um, so, so there's all of those considerations. And then if they sell, uh, there's withholding requirements around paying taxes before the, the proceeds leave the country and things like that. So there's an extra level of considerations, but when we're actually talking about the actual buying and selling, um, the, the, there's no real difference there. It's just how did, how did that money get here and who's buying? Uh, those are sort of the considerations. And if you're selling as a foreign buyer, it's how are you going to get your money out and pay your tax obligations in Canada? Um, so we do have another question coming in here about, so again, clauses, conditions. So putting in the inspection clause and not a financing clause and then not getting the financing, can they just um, say that they're not satisfied with the inspection and walk away, even though the inspection was fine, but it really was their financing that they didn't get? Good question. Typically, um, typically, you don't need to give a reason for why you're not going to fulfill one of the conditions as a buyer. So if you have a home inspection clause and while you're doing your sort of home inspection due diligence, you find that your financing is not going to come through, you can lean on that uh, inspection clause to say, you know what, we've, we've inspected the property and we feel that we don't want to go ahead and buy this. You don't have to give a, a reason. I mean, and sometimes sellers would like to know a reason, but it's, it's for your, usually the clause is written that is for your sole benefit as a buyer. So you can uh, intelligently 
until that that is waived or fulfilled, you can walk away for any reason. So yeah, you can. Okay, awesome. Thanks for addressing that one. So um, going back to the rental scenario, if a tenant won't move in, um, so it sounds like we're dealing with a lease situation here. Um, if a tenant won't move in, is he going to lose the first and last month's rent or only the last month's rent? Um, so if a tenant signed a lease and then refuses to honor the lease? Decides not to move in, changes their mind. Um, that's a really good question. I mean, technically, technically they haven't, they could be liable for the, the whole contract in, in some ways. It, it's going to be a very fact driven situation. And usually it's going to be solved with some negotiation informally between landlord and tenant. But if it we went to the landlord tenant board, um, it, it, I, I don't know how it would be resolved. It's different in every case. I mean, uh, if the tenant isn't able to pay, it may be hard for the landlord to ever collect. Uh, that last month's rent is still technically last month's rent. So if you're, if you're a tenant and you haven't used any of your months of your lease yet, that rent hasn't technically been earned. So um, for a landlord, a landlord may get into a, a murky situation saying that they're keeping all of that. Um, but then from a tenant's perspective, they have to give proper notice uh, and they're, they're breaching a the lease as well. So you've, you've definitely got a dispute there and there's no clear answer. And again, like a deposit on a real estate contract, that last month's rent is, is never like automatically, like it can't be used as a damage deposit, I guess, or it can't be used as security. It's literally meant to be the last month's rent. Um, so from a black and white perspective, it's a big question mark. Um, so it depends. Uh, it depends what side you're on. You'd you'd make some arguments uh, on on either side to your to to sort of uh, strengthen your case. But there's no there's no clear answer there. Okay. Um, yeah, there was a similar situation that another agent was asking me about the other day, where the tenant did move in um, and then were unhappy with the condition of the home, wanted to move out right away, wanted uh, you know, to be refunded their last month's rent. Uh, so what do you say in that situation? As realtors, this sounds like a landlord tenant issue. Uh, you know, maybe employers might need to be involved, but what, uh, what do you say about that situation? Yeah, that, that's another difficult situation and it's good. It's going to be fact specific. Um, it, it's a, was the condition of the unit a lot different than when the tenant originally inspected it and agreed to, to move in. Um, are, are the, do the conditions uh, violate certain minimum standards that the landlord promised to provide? Uh, if it is, then the landlord should fix those things and make it, uh, and put it back to the condition they promised. Um, all of these things matter. Uh, I, and I, at, the, at the end of the day, you're gonna have another sort of murky landlord tenant dispute. And if, you know, if, uh, if it's something that the landlord has to statutorily provide under the land, the, the residential tenancies act, then it's very clear that the, the landlord would have to do that. Say it's the roof is leaking and it's not fit for living anymore. The landlord either has to fix it immediately or provide alternative accommodation for that tenant. Um, but if it's just, you know, there's, there's a scratch on the floor and the, it, it's not something that's going to make it impossible for the tenant to, to enjoy the property, then it's a little bit more difficult. So very spe fact specific thing. And there's no, there's no general answer on that as well. Um, okay. I know. Yeah. Landlord tenant situations are always different. We do have one last question about uh, rental situations um, specifically. And I'm going to bring this up because I know it's different with COVID right now. So if a tenant doesn't pay their rent, how long does it take uh, to remove them from the property? Um, and, and can they stay without paying and how long? I know it's a different process right now with COVID. So um, what's yeah, what the, the normally situation? normally if it's a rent, yeah. Back from uh, law school days, I remember my property law professor was always, he's an old guy and he was always, always loved to say rent is sacrosanct in the landlord tenant relationship. I mean, that, that means that rent is kind of one of the most important things in the landlord tenant relationship. Uh, that definitely applies in commercial leasing, uh, less so in a residential because there are, we do have a lot of really good protections in place for tenants, but um but it is really important to pay the, the, the rent. So um, I believe it's, uh, 
15 day, 14 to 15 days, if you don't receive uh, rent from your tenant, you can then make an action in the landlord tenant board to uh, have an eviction order, uh, which is really quick because normally um, with everything else, there's a, the timelines are a lot longer for, for uh, trying to get an eviction order. So um, that's just something to remember as a tenant you should pay rent. The, the, the problem with that is as a landlord going to the landlord tenant board, it may not be that easy. Uh, if your tenant shows up and says, look, I have nowhere else to go. I have all these problems. The landlord tenant board is pretty sympathetic to tenants needs. So it's might give them, uh, you know, more opportunity to pay or some sort of arrangement or something like that. Um, what, and I assume people here are asking on behalf of landlords, um, I'm guessing, but um, there is, you know, there is like a, a, a kind of responsibility you have as a landlord under like residential, being a residential landlord is you kind of, you provide people with a home over their head and uh, essentially these rules are trying to move us away from, you know, feudal, feudal England where you could kick somebody out of their house anytime you want it. So you just, you, you have a responsibility to provide them, uh, you know, safe and secure and, and environment and, and all of that kind of thing. So that's where the landlord tenant board comes from. Uh, even if, even if they don't pay the rent at 14 days and you go and get an eviction, you ask for an eviction order, they're going to look at more of kind of the people side of things and think if what's, what's the best outcome here. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Uh, so yeah, rent's important, always pay your rent, but uh, landlords don't be so sure that if just because a tenant doesn't pay rent, you can get them out of there as per the rules as that as quickly as you'd like. Okay, perfect. So we do have another question coming in about rent control, which I know you're going to get back to us about, uh, but this one is, is a little bit specific. So there was a building registered November 19th, 2018. The owner lived there during occupancy. Um, we don't need to worry about registration date, only first occupied date. Is that correct? Does that make sense to you? Um, so, so new building owner uh, takes occupancy. It hasn't f uh, has had its final closing yet. It's this is the occupancy phase. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So Lily, if you want to just clarify, do we need to worry about registration date or only first occupied date? Okay. So if you're renting, if you're renting to someone on a, so with pre-construction, there's a couple of phases for people who don't know you. There's an occupancy phase where you get the keys and you can live in the building, but you don't actually own the condo unit until final closing. And that can be a month later, it could be two years later, it depends on the builder. But during the occupancy phase, if you get permission from the builder, uh, you can, or you're allowed, if you're allowed to in your original purchase agreement, you can rent out your unit during the occupancy phase. Um, and essentially that's almost like an assignment of the occupancy contract because when you have occupancy you don't own your condo you are living there using it under an occupancy agreement which is kind of like a lease but it isn't a lease there's just rules around what you can and can't do and you have to pay occupancy fees to the builder so during that period a lot of people especially investors they want to get a tenant in there as quickly as possible so they'll as soon as they get the keys and they have occupancy they'll rent it to a tenant um, you have to get that builder's permission, of course, but they'll rent it to the tenant. And I think the question is probably around, does that matter with regards to a term of a lease? And the answer is yes. So as soon as you start renting it to somebody, that's, that's considered the beginning of the lease to a tenant. Even though it's during the occupancy phase, it's still, you're, they're still a tenant and you're still leasing to them. Okay, so if the owner moved in in September 2008, but the building was registered November 19th, 2008, is it rent controlled? Again, uh, <laughs> I, need, I need to update my knowledge of the current situation with regards to the statutory uh, minimum increases. So I'll, I'll draft an email to everybody on, on what that is because it, okay. it changed. Perfect. It. Yeah, so that clarifies the question. I just wanted to make sure I was asking it right. Um, and then, yeah, we'll, um, we'll get there. I, I understand where they're going because dates do matter. Like the okay. when was built matters for how, how much rent you can increase your rent on. Okay, perfect. Well, let's get off this slide. Um, the buyer representation agreement. We've got other questions coming in, which is awesome. Um, let's just quickly chat about the buyer representation agreement, um, who it's yeah. between, you know, what we should be informing our clients about with respect to this document. So 
Um, for for a lot of brokerages, these are are sort of brokerage policy, uh, and it and it, if you're acting for a buyer, it protects you. It it essentially depending on how you write it, um, whether you write it for one property or you write it for a neighborhood or a whole city or you know the whole province. It's essentially your buyer is agreeing to work with you and hire you as their agent, um, and if they go and buy a property with somebody else, typically the way most of these are drafted, then they're in breach of that agreement and they would owe you that commission you would have, you would have gotten otherwise. So they're really great for buyer agents. It really feels, it makes you feel secure with your clients and you can work for them. And um, there, there's different timelines for them. You set the timeline and it can, it can be one week, it can be one month, it can be you know a year. But it's important that buyers understand what they're doing with those. It, 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 they're really hard to get out of. Um, and often buyers don't want to be, you know, restricted. So, so, so sometimes, you know, they may not want to hire you as their agent for all of Ontario because maybe they're looking to buy a cottage in Muskoka with another agent, but they're trying to buy a condo in a city place downtown Toronto with you. So you can limit it to city place and for a certain time period. Um, yeah. Uh, sometimes, you know, you know, uh, buyers don't want to sign these. So in that situation, you're going to have to decide, you know, do I trust these buyers enough to work with them and that they'll, they'll go through me and I'll get paid for my time if they, if they don't want to sign this. Um, and sometimes brokerage is required to have the, I don't know what Zolo does, but uh, I know some Royal LePage brokerages, for example, require agents to get their clients to sign these. And if buyers are uncomfortable, you can explain to them that why don't we limit it to a, one specific property even for, for you know, a really narrow period of time and then it's less onerous on the, on the buyer. Perfect. Okay. Um, so we do have some more questions coming in. The, the term firm offer is loosely used sometimes. How do you see it? Uh, good question. A firm offer uh, means no conditions. Um, so a firm offer essentially means that the buyer has agreed to buy the property as described in the agreement. Um, there's just no question as to whether or not it's going to go through. So uh, there's a there's a definitely a difference between a condition and a representation and a warranty. But a condition is something that has to happen for the the contract to 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 go through. So the the contract can't the purchase can't happen without the condition being fulfilled. Um, whereas a rep or warranty, like some reps and warranties get broken all the time in contracts, but the, but the buyers, if it, if it's a very small rep or warranty, the courts have long sa said in some of these situations that if the seller is going to refuse to help or, or or cooperate, then the buyer's recourse is to close and sue anyway for damages. Like a really small thing might be, you know, uh, the seller scratched the hardwood floor a little bit when they were moving out, and the buyer wants two hundred dollars to fix the the hardwood floor, um, and the seller is just rude and says no. Um, you as a buyer in a firm agreement even though that's a breach of an implied rep or warranty that there wouldn't be a scratch on the floor, you have to close anyway. A condition is, is something that this deal cannot happen until I as a buyer am satisfied that I have financing or I'm satisfied that uh, I've inspected the property. That's, that's my interpretation. Perfect. Does anybody okay. So that actually leads us to the next question about specific clauses or conditions that you would recommend using beyond the inspection clause, status certificate, financing. Is there anything else that we should really be putting in there? Um, really good question. It, again, entirely fact specific. Uh, there isn't kind of one catch all. Uh, I think the, the general agreements have a catch sort of, they have, you know, a whole bunch of clauses that are in the standard form agreement that are, you know, great to have as, as general requirements. And that's why they're in their standard form documents. But a couple others that um, are optional is, you know, there's often the, we agree to electronic signatures. Uh, that's, a, that's a key one. I mean, you don't necessarily have to put it in there because there is the Electronic Documents Act in Ontario, which allows for electronic signatures, but it's good to put it in so everyone's on the same page because nowadays, I'd imagine most of you are having your clients sign things by DocuSign and going real back and forth really quickly. So just having that in there puts everything, everyone on the same page. Also, a, a, you know, a, a statement saying this can be signed by counterpart. So, you know, if people are signing, uh, it's still 
know by hand, but you know, a buyer selling, there's two buyers and one signs a form and then you have another one that's blank and they sign another one and you put them together. That would allow you to sign by counterpart. Um, allowing for, there's a bit of kind of discussion. And again, this isn't that important, but it more goes to the mechanics of the transaction. There's actually a clause you put into schedule A on those standard forms that says how the buyer's gonna pay for the property at the end of the day. And uh, sometimes you know, I think there's, there's a couple uh, standard clauses people put in, but it's good to put in a, a couple of options for the buyer, like wire transfer or certified check or whatever. And essentially at the end of the day, it's the buyer's lawyer who's paying the seller's lawyer. But lawyers sometimes get in these little tiffs about, oh, we don't accept wire transfer. Well, you know, and if the contract doesn't say you can pay by wire transfer, then it's like, it just becomes frustrating. So and I think in this day and age, the most secure way to, to transfer funds is electronically and by wire transfer rather than lawyers writing checks and things like that. So um, just having a clause like that is good. Everything else would be fact, fact specific, uh, you know, properties have so especially you know i guess any property i was going to say especially sort of homes where you have garages and backyards and uh you know addressing the more detail the better and the more clarity you can put into the contract the better someone also asked a question about what what some some errors people make in contracts i i find it's i find people kind of always don't fully understand the fixtures and chattels clauses so I mean, I know you do, uh, but uh, the way we write them, it's like we're not actually addressing those things. So there, in these standard form contracts, it always says uh, fixtures excluded and then chattels included. So that's where you list all the chattels that are going to stay. Because uh, if you put nothing, all the chattels can leave. And then under fixtures excluded, that's where you exclude things. So just like th if you think about what a fixture is, it's really anything that's attached to the property. So that might even in include like wall mounted TVs. Usually a seller doesn't want to leave their wall mounted TV behind. So that should go in the excluded clause. Um, because if you can't take the TV off the wall without unscrewing it, it's probably arguably a fixture. Um, so things like that. Okay. All right. Yes, yeah, so we have some other questions coming in some situations here. So um, I'll, I'll address this one first, and then we'll go back to the rental situation. Um, so Ellen has a buyer who doesn't want her husband to have an interest in the property that they're buying. What should I do if the husband is not agreeing with this? What will happen after she closes the deal? Good question. So one thing that would be key to know here is, is this a property the husband and wife are going to live in together? Because when you're married, there's a concept of the matrimonial home. So if you're married and you live in a property, it's considered the matrimonial home. So um, even if one party is the only person going on title, um, the other spouse will have to consent to anything happening with that home. And if they were get to get divorced, uh, the home would generally be considered jointly held or 50-50. It's kind of sort of an automatic thing. So even if the wife is the only person on title, but it's a matrimony home, they live in it, the the husband would always arguably have an interest in that home as long as it remained the matrimonial home. If it's an investment property, if they're buying just a property as an investment, then for sure one spouse can be the only owner and the other party doesn't, the other spouse doesn't have to have an interest. It can be just hers or just his. Um, and she doesn't or he doesn't need her consent or she doesn't need his consent. Uh, where it matters is anything to do with the matrimonial home. And then it also matters if for the bank, you know, often the bank might want both spouses consenting or if their finances are all joint. It, it, the bank may feel that it, the, the risk is going to be protected if both, both parties are, you know, liable for the mortgage and things like that. Okay. So the twist with this one is that it's a gift from her dad. <laughs> so that's why she doesn't want him to have any interest, but I guess you're saying if it's a matrimonial home, he, he may still have an interest. Yeah. So if, it, if, if it's a gift from the father and it becomes the matrimonial home, matrimony home they both live in it. Um, th this really only matters if they separate, if they get divorced, uh, then one spouse would claim an interest and the courts would most likely award an interest. But the, 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 the husband doesn't have to go on title to the property. So if it's a gift from the father, sure, it can go straight to the one spouse. It can be in her name only. Um, if it's a matrimonial home and she wants to put a mortgage on it, most 
well, she's going to need the consent of the spouse because it's a matrimonial home. Um, but uh, if, for example, if the husband is refusing to allow the, the father to transfer a property into the wife's name, uh, he can't do that. It, 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 I mean, he might be able to in some you know, unusual situation, but just through the way you're explaining it, uh, he doesn't have to go on title if it's not the matrimonial home and it's a gift from a father. Okay. Uh, so going back to this rental situation, so we have a, a question coming in, a situation where they are dealing with a buyer who is very keen on leasing a residential property starting October 1st. Sorry, so not a buyer, a renter. The landlord cannot show the property as the current tenant won't allow it. Um, so now my client wants to go forward and still lease it without even looking at the property. What must I ensure to cover myself legally? So, sorry, can you just repeat it again? The buyer... Uh, so it sounds like a tenant is interested in leasing a property, um, yeah. site and scene. So what, what must the agent ensure to cover herself legally? So uh, a, a, a tenant is planning to rent a property, um, but they haven't seen the property. Right. Um, it, it, it's similar to if you're buying a property without seeing a property, it, you know, it's very risky because you may not know what you're, what you're getting. Um, so if, if you're asking what should the agent do to protect themselves, I would put a clause into to these agreements saying the buyer acknowledges that they have never physically seen the property and they are accepting the property as is, um, you know, just to clean up any uh, ambiguities there. Okay. Perfect. All right. So I think um, we have some upcoming slides here, but I think we've got questions coming in as well. So um, I have a question regarding clause eight and 11 on an agreement of purchase and sale. What are those paragraphs? Um, just uh, if you want to just let us know what they are, we'll ask. Uh, uh, I, I, need to, I need to pull up an agreement here to, to see it. I don't have one in front of me, but let me just, uh, I don't know if I'm going to lose video by going onto my screen here. Yeah. Let me see if I have one as well that I can pull up or, um, yeah, Jared, just, uh, yeah, absolutely. You can speak. Let me, <laughs> yes, you can speak. Let me just find you in the list here. Just unmute yourself. I think you should be able to do that. I actually have um, a really great annotated uh, agreement of purchase and sale that I can, I could send uh, to you, Jane, you can share it with your team. That'd be but, great. Um, it, there was a working group of lawyers who got together and looked at every clause in those standard form agreements and kind of broke them down and explained them and all the case law around how they've been tested in court and stuff like that. It's quite interesting. So I think you, everyone here would really benefit from, from having that. Absolutely, okay, that's great. So Jared, I believe your mic is on. Sure, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay. So I, I ran into an issue that I believe was gonna get, is going to get resolved. But what came up is there was a work order placed on a property that was not disclosed to us as the buyer. Okay. When the time came for close, uh, it came up because it was registered on title. The city uh, saw the for sale sign registered it on title. But the owner had already known about it since last year, apparently. When we pushed to get it inspected, which for other reasons was delayed. The lawyer was disappeared for a week and the inspector was away on vacation. Um, the selling side said that they would exercise uh, an option in, I think it's clause 11 regarding the title to cancel the deal. They said, no, even though the deal had gone firm and had already been in breach beyond the closing date, now almost two weeks, uh, they just said, well, we'll just tear up the deal based on uh, 11 and there's going to be no compensation for anybody. There's going to be no damages for anybody. So I would just like to get some sort of yeah. clarification in your opinion. Is that for the seller's protection, the title, or is it for the buyer's protection solely? I, that's, a, that's a really good question. And one thing I always try to emphasize when I'm, when I'm doing these Q and A's is I, I just want to make sure I'm not giving legal advice here. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of answering these questions, not knowing all the facts, but I, I've had a lot of these similar situations come up um, to, to assume that one party can just walk away from the transaction. Uh, no harm, no foul uh, raises a whole bunch of questions for me. Um, I, it, you know, I, it, I'm, I'm prima facie sort of a, like examination listening to that. I, 
I, I just don't think that's correct. Um, but with regards to work orders and things like that, a buyer does not have to assume a property with open building permits with violations from the city. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always good to search for those. Uh, like it's really, you know, some, sometimes lawyers, when they're, when they're doing a purchase, they may not. Um, I mean, if you're going to find a, a work order, a violation that's registered on title, obviously all lawyers are going to find that, but sometimes yeah. people don't do building permit searches mm -hmm. and, and it, which is a similar thing. And you don't have to accept the property with a, with an open permit that you, the, the, the seller should uh, close it or do what it takes to close it. Um, what's going to happen, title insurance plays a big role in these types of situations in this day and age. So um, if, if you find it that there's an open work order or open permit or something like that, typically title insurance has to know about it and they're going to exclude coverage from anything like that. If you don't know about it, uh, probably title insurance will provide coverage. Uh, in some cases, they, they're, they've been refusing. But um, and if you're a seller and you're trying to sell and you have an open buy a permit or a violation, you can always go to your existing title insurance company and ask them if they will extend coverage to the new buyer. So basically they blanket coverage over everybody and then the buyer can assume the property knowing they have coverage for that. They, they may or may not do that. They, they might not in this situation because it sounds like the work order might be pretty severe and will have immediate direct costs that the insurance company is going to want to cover. Um, you even even if uh, a seller feels and justifies that they can walk away from a deal like this, um, that doesn't mean that the buyer doesn't have damages, and that doesn't uh, preclude the buyer from uh, claiming damages against the seller, suing the seller for uh, you know leading them on, misrepresentation, all their costs associated with this deal, maybe even. Uh, the damages they have or the, the losses they have from trying to go back in the, into the market and get a similar thing. So it, it's very fa fact specific. I would caution that I'm not sure a seller can easily uh, excuse themselves from a deal like that, especially if they, their hands aren't clean, if they knew about it and didn't disclose it. Um, so. But yeah. is that so I guess the question is, is, is that clause, if you can read through it or take a peek at it, is it for the seller's protection or for the buyer's protection? My understanding it's, is the buyer's the, protection. The title, yeah, you're right. It's for the buyer's protection, 100%. It's, it's a clause that, and that's a clause that also deals with the requisition date. And that's where, when a, a buyer is supposed to raise any title issues or, or things they've discovered through uh, their title search. Yes, gotcha. Okay. Which so is what I presumed, but yeah. Yeah. So, and that, that that's another thing that you can modify these contracts to you know, sometimes, sometimes we're always thinking about protecting the buyer, but then that can shift really quickly where all of a sudden the buyer's best interests are to keep the deal going. Um, whereas sometimes these clauses are set up, you know, to give the buyer an out and now the buyer, you know, the buyer want the best interest of the buyers to keep the deal going. So well, we that, adding yeah, sorry. That's what we've done. We, we opted to do it and they've just kind of started to do anything they can to frustrate the deal or, or uh, weasel their way out of it essentially. And they're trying to enforce that clause to some degree and we've just said no um but anyways okay yeah that 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 sounds like uh you're heading towards uh, uh a, a bit of a fight there so um yeah I, i'm happy to chat with you offline about that anytime okay. um but uh I, I assume both buyer and seller have good good legal representation working on it because that's definitely a you know as the agent i would sort of try and extricate myself from that and allow the lawyers to to advise on it and, and help the clients move forward. Yeah, that's that's kind of what we've done. It, it just seems that they, they're not volunteering any um, compensation and they just said like, you can either cancel it or, or come after us. That's kind of your, your options. Uh, but okay, yeah, I don't want to take up everybody's time, but that's a, a specific. It, 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 gets, it gets into other issues too, where, I mean, you, both parties have to sign a mutual release here. Uh, you know, if your your buyer's opinion is a deal is not terminated and the seller saying it is, that's that's might be for something that a court has to decide. And yeah. uh, you know, if the sellers quickly like cancel the deal and go sell it to somebody else, they're potentially taking on a lot of liability there because the, this deal hasn't been you no know, people haven't released each other from it yet. So yeah, yeah. It's a gamble on the seller's part to think that they're in the right when the when the 
when this, the buyer's not uh, agreeing. Sorry, I don't know if you guys can hear that. I have an 11 month old child downstairs who seems to be screaming. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, no problem. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Thanks for your question. You know what, I'm just gonna jump ahead here and share your contact information again, just so that uh, for those of you who maybe had a question that I didn't, I didn't address, uh, you can definitely reach out to David and uh, here's his contact information again for you. I do have, um, I think one more question coming in and then uh, I think we're gonna, I think we're at time. So is there a way for agents to check outstanding orders on title? Um, so, Yes. Uh, well, actually, I don't know what agents have access to. I mean, the land registry, uh, you can pull out a, a, a pin for a property. You can, you can search the pin and get the pin sheet, and it'll have every registration, any, any violations or work orders that are registered by the city against title. That is less common, though. Um, in the city of Toronto, you can search building permits really easily. So a good thing to know ahead of time on any property is, are there any open permits or violations? And sometimes violations aren't registered against title or they're just issued by the city. So if you just Google Toronto building permits, you can type in any address and it'll show you what permits are outstanding on properties, what work's being done on them, that kind of thing, what status the permits add. If you know it's for a whole house reno, they've passed plumbing, passed electrical, but they haven't passed uh, you know, framing or something, you can you can know the status on the property. And and sometimes when you're selling you'll do a search and see that there's a building permit open from like 20 years ago. And the, and the, the current owners had no idea. And uh, sometimes these can be really tricky to, to, to have closed. So I, I highly recommend doing that. Um, just, and it'll impress your clients too. If you're like, Oh, this, you know, they're, they're putting in an offer and you can say, Oh, let's put in the offer that building permit XXXX will be closed prior to closing. Uh, it, you know, a, a, a good lawyer will pick that up uh, for you. But if you, you know, you pick that up and put that in the contract, it's, you know, your client's like, wow, it's, it's, this agent's doing, doing their due diligence. And it's really easy. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This was super informative. I think we got to everybody's questions. So thanks again for joining me today. And again, if you guys want to reach out to David, there's his contact information, um, info at coachhouselaw.com. And uh, yeah. Thanks again, David. It's always nice having you on here with me. Yeah, it was great to talk, and uh, these things always go by so fast. And uh, you know, if anyone wants to give me a call and ask similar questions, feel free to reach out. If I'm on, a, if I'm busy, I'll just call you back. Uh, so leave a message, and uh, you can always reach out to Lawson too, who is uh, the brains behind this operation. Um, and uh, his, if you go to our website, his number and and emails there as well. So thanks a lot for having me. Amazing. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, everybody's saying thank you. Thank you. So <laughs> um, thanks again. And uh, that's it for today. We'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks, David. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you.